Good afternoon, everybody. It is now two o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, this is Marissa Smith. I'm the Marketing Director at EOS Worldwide, and I just want to thank you for taking the time to join us today for the How to Be a Great Boss webinar. Before we get started, I do have a quick, a couple of quick housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, just to let you know that everybody on the call is muted, so we shouldn't have to worry about background noise interrupting the call. Um, secondly, we will have time for Q&A at the end of the webinar, so if you have a question, you can go ahead and use the question feature uh, on the GoToWebinar panel of your screen. Uh, we'll get to as many questions as we can, and then at the end, we will give you a link to a page where you can submit other questions after the webinar if we don't get to everybody. Thirdly, uh, we will be recording this webinar, so you don't have to worry about taking notes while you're watching and listening. Uh, after the webinar concludes, we will send out an email with a list of resources and next steps and a link to the webinar recording. And finally, during today's webinar, you will hear references to EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System. EOS is a holistic business management system created by Gina Wickman, author of Traction, Get a Grip, Rocket Fuel, and How to Be a Great Boss. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Renee Bohr, co-author with Gina Wickman of How to Be a Great Boss. Renee combines 30 years of business experience with 10 years as a certified EOS implementer to help bosses create a shared vision, become more disciplined to execute their vision, and build healthier, more cohesive teams. So Renee, take it away. Well, thank you, Marissa, and good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to spend the next hour discussing this very important topic with each of you. And the fact that you signed up for this session suggests that you care about your people and you want to learn how to become a great boss. So for this session to be helpful, I ask only that you be completely open-minded, and you're going to hear some things today that will challenge how you view your role as a boss. So I ask only that you just let go of the past. Don't worry about all the things that you could have done or should have done differently. Put that behind you. Now during this session, I will explain six simple tools that are part of the Be a Great Boss toolkit. And I'll also be sharing some other EOS tools. Now all these tools are available free from our website. And Marissa will share this information with you at the end of this webinar. So I'd like to start with a quote by comedian George Carlin, and I think he did a marvelous job summing up today's state of affairs. And maybe some of you are thinking about this right now, and that is that most people work just hard enough not to get fired and get paid just enough money not to quit. So here's what we know about today's workforce. Worldwide, only 87, or actually 87% of employees are not engaged at work. In this country, 39% of employees have no idea of their company's goals and objectives. 47% are unfamiliar with the state of their company's performance. And 44% have no idea how their role helps the organization meet its goals. And in this country, we also know that only about 32% of employees are actively engaged at work. So we've got some work to do. And that's the status quo. And as President Reagan once quipped, oh yeah, status quo, that's Latin for the mess we're in. So think about this if you're a business owner. One of the most important decisions that you make is who you promote as a boss. The right decision propels your organization forward, and the wrong decision will set it back. Now more than ever, we need great bosses. Not so great bosses just won't cut it. Not in today's environment. So while writing this book with Gino, people asked us, why are you using the title boss? It has so many negative connotations. Well, there are hundreds of titles used to describe people who lead and manage others. And admittedly, many of them are not very flattering. And let's admit it, some of them are pretty doggone negative. Now, some organizations have tried to come up with all sorts of titles, like coach, team leader, uh, I've even heard people champion, that they feel somehow downplay the negative connotations connected with that title boss. 
But here's why we purposely chose that word. You see, the word boss comes from the Dutch word boss, which was a term of respect used to address a person in charge. You know, I sincerely hope that you'll keep an open mind and take today's message to heart and wear the title boss with pride. Now, before we go any further on the subject of being a great boss, you must first embrace four simple truths. And the very first one is that being a great boss can be simple. You know, you can read hundreds of books on the subject, and believe me, I have, and I felt like they were just twisting me up in knots, and some of what I was reading was pretty contradictory. But it can be very simple, and I'll show you how. Secondly, your style doesn't really matter. Whether you're introverted or extroverted, stern or easygoing, just be yourself. Just be you, but you've got to be consistent. You must genuinely care about your people. You know, the old saying is so true. No one cares what you know until they know that you care. And finally, you must want to be great. No one can talk you into it. You have to genuinely want the role. You have to have that inner drive to succeed. Now, don't take the boss or the title boss for granted because you must earn it. So on a scale of 1 to 10, where 10 is high, the bosses that we usually work with uh, rate accountability on, within their organizations about a 4 or 5 on a scale of 1 to 10. And I'm often asked the question about accountability, how can I hold my people more accountable? Well, the simple answer is that you just can't. Accountability is a byproduct of two things, great leadership and great management. Think of it as a formula where leadership and management equals accountability. And when you excel at both leadership and accountability, or leadership and management, accountability is the byproduct. So you can't hold people accountable. You have to create that environment where people take responsibility for getting results and accept the accountability that goes with it. Now, it's also important to define leadership and management. What makes each different and at the same time equally important? So leadership is about working on the business. It's about providing clear direction, creating an opening, and leadership is about thinking, spending time planning. On the flip side of the coin, management is about working in the business, about cl creating clear expectations, communicating effectively, and it's about doing, really executing on those plans. You know, another way to describe the difference between leadership and management and the importance of both is to consider leadership as creating a vision and management as executing on that vision. As Thomas Edison said, vision without execution is complete hallucination. Now, being a great leader without also being a great manager or vice versa will not make you a great boss. You have to be great at both. So to be a great boss, you must consistently apply five leadership practices and five management practices. So let's start with the five leadership practices. As I share these, I ask that you think of each person that reports directly to you. These people would call you their boss. They're your direct reports. So give it some thought and write down their names. Who are the people that report directly to you? And write down the total number as well. So is it one person? Is it two? Is it four? Is it seven? Whatever the number, just keep that number in mind and keep those names in mind as we go through each one of these practices. So the first practice is giving direction, giving clear direction. Now, this doesn't mean telling people what to do. Giving direction is about creating an opening, an opportunity for your direct reports to take the ball and run with it. Think of an opening as a sort of vacuum. You know, the saying is that nature abhors a vacuum. It must be filled, and leaders create that opening in a number of ways. One of those is sharing a compelling vision. 
You can do this by answering eight questions and then sharing the answers with your people. So here we go with those eight questions. The first one is core values. Now core values are the qualities, characteristics, and attributes that align your people with your core values. They define your culture and also the kinds of people that you really want to surround yourself with. Secondly, it's core focus. This defines your organization's sweet spot, why it, is, why it exists, which is usually your organization's purpose, passion, or cause, and then what that organization is truly great at, its niche. The third question is, what is your 10-year target? Now, Jim Collins calls this the BHAG, the Big Hairy Audacious Goal, but the intent here is to truly and in uh, inspire and motivate everyone in the organization to think differently, to attain a goal that's bigger than themselves. Fourth, it's your marketing strategy. This defines your target market, that ideal customer, the differentiators that truly matter to them, we call them uniques, as well as your illustrated proven process, which tells a customer or client how you do what you do, and a guarantee or promise. Fifth, it's what's the three-year picture. So this is not a deep dive strat plan. This just gives everybody in the organization a picture of what you will look like just three years in the future on your way toward achieving that 10-year target. So that kind of makes up a clear picture of your vision, those answering those five questions. The sixth question is, what's your one-year plan? This is really bringing that vision down to earth. The seventh question then is, what are your quarterly rocks? What are those key priorities that have to be met each quarter to ensure that you're on track to meet your one-year plan? And then finally, what are the issues that have to be addressed in the next 12 months? And think of issues as topics. Yeah, there are obstacles and barriers oftentimes, but sometimes they're simply opportunities or ideas that need to be addressed. So that's vision. And with that completed, the next step is to ensure that people in your organization clearly see it. You know, you oftentimes hear people say, you know, I can see what you're saying. And that's the challenge here. You have to repeat it often enough that it gets to a point where it's shared by all. And shared by all is so much different than just shared with all. Shared with all is when you put it on posters and hang it up in the office. But shared by all is when you get it to a point where everyone in the organization sees it clearly. So answer this question about providing a clear direction, either yes or no. Now remember, to give yourself a yes, you must be doing this practice with each one of your direct reports. So if you have four or you have five, you're doing this, you're giving clear direction to each one of those direct reports. If you've missed somebody, you must answer no. Now, the next leadership practice is pr providing the necessary tools. After you've given clear direction, you have to give your direct re reports the tools that they need to succeed. You know, getting everybody all excited about where you're going and why it's important and then not giving them what they need to succeed is debilitating. Of the tools listed, the one that costs little but has the greatest impact is giving your direct reports your time and your attention. Sadly, most bosses don't either have the time or make the time. And we're going to cover this next. But first, and answer either yes or no. Remember, to answer yes, you must be providing necessary tools for each of your direct reports. So, you're giving clear direction and providing the necessary tools, including your time and attention, and now it's time to let go of the vine, to get out of their way and let them run with it. Now, many leaders can't let go because they either don't have the right people 
or they're trying to do their people's work to improve your time capacity. Exercise that we call delegate and elevate. Delegate and elevate is our first of six tools that I'll be showing you today, and it works like this. It involves a five-step process, and you can't rush the process. It starts with writing down all the work-related activities that you find yourself doing over the course of a day, week, and month. These include both technical and people-related activities. So when you have your list completed, it's going to look something like this. Move the people-related items, those things that are boss-related, things like recognizing, rewarding, coaching, hiring, training, move those to the third column. So you're going to end up with something that looks pretty close to this. The third step, then, is to place all these activities into one of four quadrants. Let me just go through each one. The first quadrant in the upper left-hand box is things that you love doing and you're truly great at doing. The quadrant on the upper right, quadrant number two, are activities that you like doing and you're good at doing. Now, hopefully, you you understand the thin line between like and good and love and great. The third quadrant are activities that you really don't like doing for a variety of reasons, but you just happen to be good at doing them. And then the fourth quadrant are things that you neither like doing nor are you good at doing them. So the final step, and this is the most important, is to begin planning how to improve, improve your time capacity. And to do this, you must delegate the quadrant three and four activities to others. However, if you have direct reports, you cannot delegate the boss-related activities. And this is where many bosses fail. They think that technical knowledge and expertise is all they need to be a great boss. But nothing could be further from the truth. Now, what I've discovered is that many bosses won't let go for all sorts of reasons that characterize as their own personal head trash. You know, things like, no one can do it as well as I can, or it's faster when I just do it myself, or, you know, it takes too long to train someone. Head trash aside, before you go, letting go, right, before you let go, you have to ensure that all of your people are in the right seats. Otherwise, you're going to end up doing their work while your work, namely leading and managing, suffers. So, each direct report has to be the right person, and that means they share your organization's core values, but they must also be in the right seat. They have to get it, want it, and have the capacity to do it. We call this GWC for short, and let me explain what we mean by each one. Get it means that they have the natural ability and aptitude, the intuitive feel for the job. You've probably worked with people for maybe months or even years, and you've trained them, you've, you've sent them to seminars, and finally one day you wake up and you go, you know what, this person just doesn't get it. Secondly, they have to genuinely want it. There must be a genuine desire to do the job. You're not overcompensating them. You're not offering them all sorts of special incentives. They're coming to the work each day because they genuinely want to do the job. And when you think about get it and want it, this is kind of about having batteries included, people, because you can't coach or train get it and want it. And the third third piece is called capacity to do it. And to have the capacity to do it, they have to have the heart, brains, stamina, and self-discipline to do the job, the emotional, intellectual, physical, and time capacity to do it. So when your direct reports get it, want it, and have the capacity to do it, it's important for you to get out of the way and let them run with it. To paraphrase my favorite U.S. President, Teddy Roosevelt, the best executives are the ones who have sense enough to pick good people to do what they want done and self-restraint enough to keep from meddling with them while they do it. So 
How are you doing? Can you answer yes to this practice? Are you doing it with each one of your direct reports? So just simply answer yes or no. The next leadership practice is acting with the greater good in mind. Great leaders ensure that they consistently do this. Sadly, some leaders put themselves or their departments first. Egos get in the way. Now ask yourself if your decisions and actions are for the greater good or for your own personal advancement. Would each of your direct reports give you an emphatic yes to this question? So again, answer yes or no. And then finally, the last leadership practice is taking clarity breaks. To quote Adriana Huffington, if we cannot disconnect, we cannot lead. Creating a culture of burnout is opposite to creating a culture of sustainable creativity. You know, I've read dozens of books about great leaders, and one thing they all have in common is that they schedule time to think. I encourage you to take clarity breaks, and this is our third tool, by the way. Get a journal and set time aside each week or month, whatever works for you, to get out of the office and think. Write down a list of topics that you must address and you know the kinds of things that are causing you angst or diminishing your self-confidence. Write those things down. Stephen Covey calls these kinds of things the things that are important but not urgent. And sadly, most of us are caught up in the tyranny of urgency. Reflect on your strengths, how you can leverage them, your plan to do more of what you love to do and are great at doing, and a strategy for how you can offload and delegate the other things. Think about your next people move. What is it that you want from your business and from your life? And that's the purpose of a clarity break, to really elevate yourself above the business. So, again, answer yes or no. Are you making time to think? So, here's a summary of those five leadership practices. I'm providing, I'm giving clear direction, I'm providing the necessary tools, I'm letting go of the vine, I act with the greater good in mind, and I take clarity breaks. So, before we move on to the management practices, there's a couple of action steps for you. And first is I'd like you to commit to a date when you'll be able to answer yes to each of these five leadership practices. Now, just as a benchmark, most people choose about six months to be able to get to this point where they can say yes with each of your direct reports. And my second action step for you is to schedule your very first clarity break. Schedule your clarity break. So those are the two action steps. So again, just a quick review. Leadership, working on the business, providing clear direction, creating the opening, and thinking. That's the definition of leadership. And the definition of management is working in the business, creating clear expectations, communicating effectively, and it's about doing. So as Stephen Covey said, effective leadership is putting first things first, Effective management is discipline, the discipline to carry it out. So next we're going to cover the five management practices. And the first one is keeping expectations clear. And this is always a two-way street. You must be clear about your expectations of your direct reports and just as importantly, their expectations of you as their boss. So are the roles that you each play clear to each other? Are the behaviors that show alignment around your organization's core values clearly understood? Are you both clear on the key priorities, we call them rocks, for the next quarter? Are metrics in place, the measurable that let each of you know whether you're winning or not? So are expectations of each other absolutely crystal clear? Answer that question either yes or no. So with expectations clear, you now must ensure that you're communicating well. And this means that there can be no assumptions. You know, when you listen to conversations around the office, oftentimes those conversations are around assumptions. So 
That's how rumors start, right? That's how rumors start and that's how rumors are spread. And why is this? It's because sometimes we're just afraid or reluctant to confront each other and ask questions. In fact, we spend more time assuming and telling than we do just simply asking. So here are some tips on how you can improve your communication. And the very first one is called two emotions. The way this works is when you feel that you're not on the same page or something is just funky, you just ask somebody, if you could share two emotions right now, one positive and one negative, what would they be? You go first and then I'll go. It's amazing how this creates some clarity. The second one is understanding the question to statement ratio. And we suggest keeping in mind the 80-20 rule where you're asking and listening 80% of the time versus talking and telling. The third one is what we call echoing. So when someone tells you something, you slow down and say, you know, hang on, what I heard you say was, or when you explain something to someone, you could ask, could you repeat back what I just said? It's amazing how this creates some real clarity. And then finally, we call this thump thump, and this comes from a client of ours who shared a study that was done at Stanford University in which pairs of students faced off uh, with each other. So one student had a simple list of well-known songs, things like Happy Birthday, Row, Row, Row Your Bow, Twinkle, Twinkle Little Star, things like that. Now that student would tap out the song while the other student tried to guess the song. So of 120 songs, the average correct guesses was 3%. So when you're talking, it sounds pitch perfect to you. It's a symphony, but the receiver is only hearing thump, thump. So the next management practice is having the right meeting pulse. So this is where we have an even exchange of dialogue. We're reporting measurables and we're keeping the circles connected. And this is our fourth tool for the day, really figuring out the right meeting pulse. Fact of the matter is, sometimes you have new people that need a little bit more time, and sometimes you have more experienced people that might need a little less time. You just have to ensure that you're keeping the circles connected. And let me show you an illustration of what I mean. So when you look at number one, this is a train wreck waiting to happen. You're completely disconnected, you rarely meet, and you're just plain not on the same page. Number two is where you're just micromanaging the heck out of people. You're smothering them. And you're not giving them the autonomy to get things done. And then the third one is ideal. And this is what we're looking for, is just keeping the circles connected. So you have to ask yourself, do I have the right meeting pulse with each of my direct reports? And just answer that question with a simple yes or no. So fourth, and this is a really vital part of the meeting pulse, and this is called the quarterly conversation. So the purpose of the quarterly conversation is to really build your relationship with each one of your direct reports, to build it and improve it and take it to a higher level than what you're able to do during daily or weekly meetings. Now, I've had people really scoff at this and say things like, well, you know, I talk to my people all the time. But what we're talking about here is a much higher level type of discussion. So this calls for a 30 to 45 minute, one-on-one, face-to-face, -on -face, informal meeting that's scheduled on each other's calendars quarterly. And we really recommend that you do these quarterly conversations off-site where you won't be distracted or interrupted. And again, it's about really improving communication and building that relationship with a direct report. So here are the basics. And again, remember, this is about keeping the circles connected. You want to be asking them what they think, not spending 30 to 45 minutes telling them what you think. Give them a chance to lead off, and then share what you feel is working and not working. So this is really a conversation around what's working and what's not working. It's an opportunity to recognize achievement and celebrate success, and it's also an opportunity to ask them 
what they can do to improve and how you can help. And just as importantly, it's an opportunity to ask them how you're doing, how you're doing and what you might be able to do better as a boss. Now, because this is just a conversation, there's really no need to document it. It's okay to keep some notes, but there's no form to fill out and there's really no form that has to be turned in. Remember, the purpose is to improve your relationship, not just improve performance. And the context for the quarterly conversation is a very, very simple tool that we call the 555. So when I first saw this illustration, I thought, well, this is a little silly. But again, it's simple. And it's simple for a reason, because this is the context. This is the visual that I want you to keep in your head as you're having that face-to-face -face meeting. This is a conversation around what's working and what's not working as it relates to core values, to rocks, and to roles. Now, we call it the 555 because most organizations have five core values. There's five roles for each seat, and generally people have about five rocks. Now, in some organizations, there might be three core values, there may be only two, uh, and there might be five roles. Well, it's a heck of a lot easier to remember 555 five, five than 325. Make sense? So, remember, it has to be face-to-face. -face. This is not something that we're doing over the phone. You have to remember the words of Mr. Miyagi in The Karate Kid. Look I. You must always look I. So in preparation for the quarterly conversation, you're taking time to assess core values and GWC as it relates to each one of your direct reports. So you're going to use a very simple tool called the People Analyzer, and this is our sixth tool for today. And I'll just walk you through what this, what this uh, looks like. First, what I want you to do is list your core values along the columns at the top, and then list your direct reports names in the lines below uh, each of those core values. So it ends up looking something like this. So in this example, the core values are help first, grow or die, be humbly confident, do the right thing, and do what you say. Next, we're going to give each person a rating, and the rating is really simple. So it's either a plus, a plus minus, or a minus. And for it to be a plus, someone is really exhibiting this core value most of the time. Not always. No one's perfect. So it's just most of the time. A plus minus means sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. So about 50-50. And a minus means that most of the time they do not. So it's not never, again, it's just most of the time they do not. And that's the simple rating system, a plus, a plus minus, or a minus. Now, to make the people analyzer even more effective is we're also going to add in GWC. Remember, get it, want it, and capacity to do it. And now the rating is a little different. The rating is simply a yes or a no. So there's no maybes, and there's nothing on a scale of one to five. It's either yes or no. To make the people analyzer have some real relevance, you have to add the bar. And the bar is your minimal acceptable standard for people who need or exceed your standard for great people. So in core values, we just simply suggest that you have more pluses than plus minuses with no minuses. And again, for GWC, it has to be all yeses. And having a no in either a get it or want it is a deal breaker. As I said earlier, those are the two things that really can't be coached. A no in capacity, though, can be addressed, but only if you and your organization has the time to devote to training and developing someone. You know, it's just not fair to the person or your to let someone who is below the bar languish for weeks, months, and sadly, sometimes years. So when you're using this people analyzer, you're going to run into four issues. Now, they come in a gazillion disguises, but it really does boil down to four things. 
And the very first one is you might have, uh, a, you, the very first one is you have the right person in the right seat. So when I look at this, and you're probably doing the same thing, you're saying, well, hang on a minute, right person, right seat? I thought that was our definition for great people. So just hold that, that thought for a minute. The second one is where you have right person, they share your core values, but they're in the wrong seat. For whatever reason, the seat's too big, the seat's too small, they're just in the wrong seat. The third one, and this is a difficult one, this is where you have a right seat. The person absolutely gets it, wants it, and has the capacity to do it, but, but they're just the wrong person. They are caustic to your organization. They don't embrace the culture. They don't share your core values, and they're really undermining everything that you're trying to do for the greater good. And then the last one is the most obvious, where you have both a wrong person and wrong seat. So what's the aha here? Well, the aha is issue number one, right person, right seat, because these are your best people. These are the ones that are rowing like crazy to compensate for all the people who aren't rowing, or might even still be standing on the dock. And these are the folks that sadly get the least amount of your time. And that's a big issue. So, again, what group takes most of your time and attention? It's the people who are either in two, three, and four, and the one that needs the most is usually the right person in the right seat. So, are you having quarterly conversations with each of your direct reports using both the People Analyzer and the 555? Just answer this question, either yes or no. The fifth leadership practice is rewarding and recognizing. So Napoleon said, the soldier will fight long and hard for a bit of yellow ribbon. Although money is important, it's a fact that people will work harder for recognition than they'll work for money. Yet despite this, managers often admit that they're really uncomfortable giving praise for a job well done. And the cynical ones will say something like, well, you know, that's what I pay them to do. Or, you know, if I recognize them or reward them, they're going to expect a raise. So no small wonder that lack of recognition is another reason for great people moving on to other organizations where they feel will be appreciated. You know, the best recognition programs are spontaneous, they require no administrative time, and they cost virtually nothing. Napoleon figured that out over 200 years ago with a strip of yellow ribbon, and Caesar 1,800 years before Napoleon. Now, just as important as positive feedback, recognition, and reward, just as important is negative feedback. And negative feedback should always be given quickly when you see behavior that's inappropriate or unacceptable. Don't wait and then gunny sack people later with a laundry list of shortcomings. Now there's a thin line between being friendly and being friends. Don't ever cross the line between being someone's boss and being their buddy. So if you do everything that we've reviewed so far, in terms of leadership practices and, manu and management practices, you'll rarely have to apply the three-strike rule. Now, this is sometimes called a PIP, or Performance Improvement Plan in organizations, and it essentially works like this. Strike one is where you meet with the person, clearly identify the problem, and have three examples ready of, of that problem. You clarify your expectations, you determine a course of action, a time frame for completion, and you schedule the next meeting. Now, it's important to always have three examples of whatever issue you're really calling someone uh, on the carpet for. First one, they're going to just uh, argue with and say, well, that's just total coincidence. The second one, well, you might be picking on them, but by the third one, you're going to get acknowledgement. They're going to say, okay, you got me. So that's important in that first meeting. So whatever the time frame was, let's say it was four weeks, four weeks later, you're meeting with the person again. If the person has met your expectations during this strike two meeting, they're above the bar, things are good, the issue's been solved. But if not, you have to schedule the third meeting. And if the issue 
isn't resolved by the third meeting, you have to be prepared to terminate that person because they just haven't met your expectations. So my question of you is, are you consistently rewarding and recognizing each direct report? Just give yourself either a yes or a no. So to summarize the five management practices, it's all about keeping expectations clear, communicating well, having the right meeting pulse, holding quarterly conversations, and doing a great job of rewarding and recognizing. And before we move on, there's a couple of action steps. So the first one is commit to a day when you will be able to answer yes to each of these five management practices. So, so it's the same challenge that we had uh, that I had for you when we reviewed the five leadership practices. And secondly, I'd like you to get out your calendar and schedule your next quarterly conversation with each of your direct reports. And I would recommend that you use both the leadership checklist or the leadership practices assessment and the management practices assessment as a checklist that you can review with that person face to face. So do these, th do these things right after this uh, webinar. Don't procrastinate. So once again, just in summary here with the definition of leadership and management, leadership is working on the business, it's providing clear direction, creating the opening, thinking, and management is about working in the business, creating clear expectations, communicating effectively, and it's about exit, about execution. So by, <clears throat> by applying the five leadership practices, you will become a great boss. And a great boss creates an environment where the byproduct is accountability. So we have about 255 people on today's call. So I really want to thank you for your participation. My sincere hope is that each of you apply those five leadership and five management practices on a consistent basis. And when you do, I'm confident that one day soon, one of your direct reports is going to smile at you and say, you know what, you're the best boss I've ever worked for. Thank you for your time and for your attention. Renee, that was <laughs> great. Thank you. So before we take a few questions, I just want to share a few next steps um, that you can take on your journey to become a great boss. And while I'm doing that, please feel free to en en uh, enter any questions that you have into the question pane because we do have about uh, 10 minutes at the end of this uh, session to answer those questions. Um, so there is a free download available of the How to Be a Great Boss Toolkit. So all of the tools that Renee mentioned on the session today, the People Analyzer, uh, the um, Annual Review, the Quarterly Conversation, all of those tools are available in the toolkit. And you can visit BeAGreatBoss.com to download your free copy. Um, we also would encourage you to consider becoming a member of Basecamp. So Basecamp is our online training resource that equips you to implement EOS like an expert. So there are uh, tons of downloads and videos and implementer guides and all sorts of resources available to you uh, if you want to learn how to implement EOS in your own organization. And Finally, uh, if you are already working with a professional implementer, you can feel free to reach out to them for additional guidance on using these tools and practices in your company. Uh, but if you're not working with an EOS implementer, you can always request a free 90-minute meeting on the EOS website, um, and a, we will match you up with a professional or certified implementer to give you an overview of EOS and all of these, how to use all of these tools and best practices inside your organization. So all of these uh, links and downloads will be sent to you in an email right after this uh, session. So with that said, we do have a few questions here. Um, so I'm gonna give, go ahead and start with Alyssa's question, which is, um, how do you generate buy-in on a company vision? Shared by all versus shared 
with all? Do you involve them in the process and to what degree? That's a great question. And one of the very first steps after completing uh, the answers to those eight questions is to do what we call a state of the company meeting where you have an opportunity to share with people in your organization where you've been, where you are, and where you're going. And part of that where you're going is sharing this vision. Now you got to remember they have to hear it seven times to really hear it the first time. And this is a challenge. Uh, so you have to think about all the different ways that you can communicate your vision. So it's face-to-face -face meetings, it may be one-on-one -on -one conversations, every opportunity that you have to share bits and pieces of the vision that you've crafted is what it takes to really ensure that it's shared by all. And you've got to ask people to kind of play it back to you a little bit. So uh, it's a journey, and it's not anything that you're going to do uh, successfully by just having one meeting with all of your people. You have to be committed to repeating it often. Thanks, Renee. And I think the other part of Alyssa's question was, do you involve them in the process? So do you involve the entire company in the process, or who do you recommend uh, including in the vision building uh, part sure. of the... Yeah. So, so the vision is always created by the owner of the business and the leadership team. So they create and craft have this vision and then begin to share it with the next level and with the next level after that and so on and so forth. So just to be clear, it's a vision is, is always created by, uh, by the owner and the leadership team. Great. Thanks for clarifying. We've got another question here from uh, Jason. Uh, how does a boss working in the business and on the business yield accountability from direct reports? I'm not quite making the connection. And I'm not sure I completely understand the question. Could you just repeat that? Uh, sure. It says, how does a boss working in the bus business and on the business yield accountability from direct reports? So I'm assuming that it's how does he create accountability by working both in and on? Let's go with that. Okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think, you know, accountability, again, is uh, – is really striking a balance between, uh, it's really about creating that environment, right? So there are things that you're doing working in the business that you probably shouldn't be doing. So it's handing those off to employees and handing them off to other people, but then understanding that you're not abdicating, you're not just giving it away and not ever following up on it. You've got to stay, you've got to stay somewhat involved. So it's balancing, delegating it, and not having that turn into just completely ignoring it. I don't know if I've done a great job of, of answering that, but that's what I have. He says, thank you. So I think you nailed it, Renee. Uh, let's see, we've got another question um, from Alyssa. We have been implementing weekly pulse meetings and we will begin quarterly conversations. What is your recommendation on scheduled one-on-one -on -one meetings, weekly or as needed? Sometimes they feel needed more often than other times. Do you have a okay, so there's a couple of things there. One is the quarterly conversation is quarterly, and again, it's at a higher level. But uh, if you have uh, some people call them weekly huddles or one-on-ones, there's nothing wrong with doing that. Uh, I would just you know think about the fact that you have some people that need a little bit more frequency in terms of a meeting pulse, and some not as much. So it's striking the right balance. Uh, but I find that. The kinds of conversations that you might be having weekly and one-on-one -on -one are more task-oriented, uh, whereas the quarterly conversation is a completely different level. This is an opportunity to really learn more about your people, what their aspirations are, what their expectations are, and how you might be able to, uh, to meet them. Great. Thanks, Renee. Um, we've got another question about... Um, whether or not is this process and the EOS uh, system applicable to small nonprofit organizations with a f with 15 member boards of directors? Yeah, I think the key ingredient, uh, something to keep in mind when thinking about uh, implementing EOS is uh, everyone that's involved in this process must accept accountability. And so it can work in a nonprofit. Uh, but when you are working with volunteers, 
that's always a tricky kind of thing because some volunteers are looking at their time that they're investing as sort of a nice to do thing and, and uh, they feel like I'm just a volunteer I'm here to help as much as I can where you know somebody who's really actively involved is, is someone who's going to take accountability and say uh, I will do what I said I was going to do and you have to have clarity around that so is everyone that's signing up for EOS or the process willing to accept uh, accountability great uh, let's see, we've got another question of um, one of the issues that I'm dealing with is people who don't really want the job. How common is this? It's, uh, you're not alone, whoever asked that question. This comes up a lot. Uh, you know, when you think about it, I think one of our basic needs as, as people is the opportunity to do things uh, that that really give us an opportunity to do what we're good at, right? We want to be able to, to do work that we feel is worth doing. And sometimes, for whatever reason, uh, we might be, for a long period of time, kind of becomes a routine, and pretty soon the routine becomes a rut, and you lose enthusiasm for the job. So this kind of gets back to uh, a great topic for a quarterly conversation to be able to ask someone, you know, I'm a little concerned about where you are in the organization and where you are in your current position. You know, you just don't seem as excited or as engaged as you used to be. You know, I see you not engaged in meetings, showing up late, leaving early, uh, missing important deadlines. What's up? Uh, and getting a conversation started because, again, you can't, you know, force someone to want the job. You have to challenge them, and if they're really not happy, uh, boy, your organization is going to suffer. And, and so, you got to have a conversation around what you can do to help that person really find themselves and you know find some real fulfillment doing something else. And if that can't happen in your company, you got to encourage them to try to find that outside of your company. Life is too short to be spending time doing things we really don't want to do. Great. Thanks, Renee. Uh, let's see. We've got another question. Um, what is the difference between someone's job description and the seat that you mentioned when you were talking about the uh, accountability? Yeah, that comes up quite a bit. When you, when you think about uh, just the transition from an organization that's built around jobs to an organization that has a clear accountability chart, defined by seats. Jobs are usually activities that we do. And when you look at a lot of job descriptions, it's all activity based. But when you think about a seat and having clarity around five major roles, those are the major things that someone is really signing up for and being willing to be accountable for. They're usually results based. And so that's the difference between uh, a job, which again, a little bit more activity based than a seat which is about clear expectations and results. Great. Uh, let's see. I've got another question here. Which do we do first? If we don't feel we have the right people on our leadership team, do we establish the right leadership team, or do we work on creating our vision with the team we have in place currently? Yeah, so the first, I think the first opportunity is uh, creating awareness. So if you have a team of people and you feel like, there just aren't right people that share the values, it's really worth having a conversation with that whole group. Just tee it up. You know, this is the culture of the organization. This is what we value most. Uh, let's give each other a little feedback. And this seems so foreign and so threatening to people, but it can be so simple is to just say, hey, you know, one of our values is an example. Let's say it's help first. How are we doing? Let's give each other a little feedback. Now, some people are going to respond positively and given that feedback say, you know what, that, that stung a little bit, but I could line up behind helping first. Uh, so that's the first step. Now, if you do that, there are going to be some people who just don't fit. And that's something that has to be addressed. But, but I think it's getting your arms around that. At the same time, you could be building a vision for your organization. So they don't have to be mutually exclusive. But Eventually, people who don't fit or the wrong people tend to move on, or we help them move on. 
Great. Uh, let's see. I've got another great question here on the people not wanting it issue. What is the entrepreneur's responsibility to create an environment where people want to be a part of it? Yeah, so that gets back to uh, really helping people get into uh, seats that they get, want, and have the capacity to do. And that's creating expectations right up front. And think about how we advertise for positions these days. It's usually a job description. And, you know, we post the job and we talk about uh, the resume and someone's capacity to do it, but we rarely get into really understanding whether that person's going to be a great fit for the culture. And so that cultural piece is really, really important because the wanted is sometimes not just wanting to, uh, to be in the seat, it's wanting to be in the company. And so, uh, you know, that's one that, you know, that, that, that really has to be, has to be addressed. And, that, and that's what a leadership team is all about. It's, it's constantly asking themselves, you know, are we creating the right kind of culture here where people have an opportunity each day to do what they do best? Great. So I think we have time for one more question. I'm going to go to, um, we have a visionary CEO, <clears throat> excuse me, who really wants to implement this, but is full of old habits, which go against the process. What do you recommend for the leadership team to help keep the visionary on track so we can implement it effectively? All those bad habits of visionaries. <laughs> uh, I bet you one of them is, uh, you know, being able to stay the course and being constantly distracted by shiny stuff and uh, wanting to move on to the next new thing before the leadership teams had a, a, an opportunity to really digest and implement the last great thing. And so when you think about the visionary, and I and I love visionaries. At the same time, sometimes I'd like to choke them. But uh, <laughs> the big challenge, I think, for the visionary, where, where that person can add the greatest value, is being able to be about 90 days ahead of the rest of the organization in terms of new ideas. But at the same time, they have to be able to let go and not get enmeshed and embroiled and entangled in all sorts of things that are day to day. And that's where you need it. Someone needs a really strong number two, and we call that person the integrator. Uh, and the integrator handles the day to day to free up the visionary to think about things that can really help the organization grow in dramatic ways. But you can't have it both ways. You can't hang on to the past and at the same time move on to the future. And so how a leadership team can help is to be completely open and honest with that visionary. And they're usually very strong personalities, and it's a willingness on the part of the integrator and people on the team that say, you know what, get out of the way. Let us run. Let us do what you hired us to do. And, you know, play in, in the seat that, uh, you know, that you're accountable for, and that's the visionary seat. Great. Thanks, Renee. And anybody who had um, questions that we didn't get to or if we didn't have a, a full enough response uh, for your question due to time constraints, um, you can feel free to uh, reach out to Renee directly. Um, in the email that you'll receive in a bit after the session, uh, we will have a link to a place where you can submit questions and uh, you can feel free to do that and Renee will get back to you as soon as he can. So that is all the time that we have. We really want to thank you for taking the time to join us today. Um, Renee, thank you so much for sharing your insight with everybody. Uh, it was really great. Um, as I mentioned before, we will be sending out an email with a list of resources, next steps, and a link to the recording of the webinar. Uh, we're not going to be providing the slides as a separate download at this time because we do plan to do uh, to hold other sessions of this webinar, um, but we will have the recording and all of the resources. Um, it'll take a couple of hours for the recording to process, so it may be around five o'clock when you receive the email, so don't panic if you don't have it by then, um, but you will receive that. And um, as I mentioned, we'll include a link to the page where you can submit your questions as well. So thank you again for everybody taking the time out of your busy schedules to attend the webinar and uh, have a wonderful day.